great testimonies and great encouragement in the word. And so we're going to close this thing out with looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll be looking at verse 13. Being reminded of what Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I think it's worthy of noting that Paul gives several examples of the Old Testament. And in these examples that he's given in the Old Testament are constant reminders. Reminders for not only the Corinthian church, but reminders for you and I that we're not the only ones who have been tempted or the only ones who have disobeyed or the only ones who have been dealt with by God. God is gracious, God is merciful, God's loving. And this is why we have the word. This is why we have these examples that when we find ourselves in moments of weaknesses, when we find ourselves in moment of despair and we think that nobody's going through what we're going through or nobody deals with the things that we deal with. And I think the transparency that has been clearly conveyed here is great. It shows that not just laity or the new convert or somebody who is struggling with addiction is the only one that goes through being tempted or having bouts of times where they fall into their weaknesses and they see that they struggle. Dave Trujillo, I know, he's a dear friend of mine and there have been, on these stories that he shared, it wasn't new to me. These were things that he came to me and confided in and we prayed about. It was an encouragement to me and I've called him and encouraged and, and, and confided in him, and he's encouraged me. But we look at God's word, and we know this to be true, that God doesn't leave anything undone. God desires to shape and pattern each and every single one of us into the image of the heavenly man. You see, when God looks at you and me, God sees the end result. He doesn't see the beginning. He doesn't see how we came to faith. What he sees is he sees the finished product. See, I can't see that far. I see what I struggle with and deal with now. Looking at this passage here, as Paul gives Old Testament examples, and as Pastor David Rosales shared earlier, and then Holland Davis also shared, great examples, but great reminders. We need to be reminded. Not only do we need to be reminded that there is hope, but we also need to be reminded that the Lord truly does love us. So much so that when we look at these passages here and we say to ourselves, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit ashamed to go to someone. I remember years ago looking at various programs, one step to, uh, or 12 steps, and uh, all these programs, and uh, AA and NA and every kind of, you know, other alphabet you can think of. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm being honest with you guys, I tried it all. I, I tried it all. I mean, even some way out weird stuff, man. You know, because I had a problem, and my problem was addiction. Now, I, my, my, my drug use wasn't experiential. We, we didn't get high just to get high and trip, you know? I mean, we got high to get high. We got loaded. And I always tell people, you know, I just didn't get high. Man, I was a dope fiend. Yeah. You'd be surprised. I got like maybe four good teeth, and those are the ones you guys can see. All the rest are tore back, man. I got summer teeth, some in my mouth, some in my pocket. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that I've been tempted all throughout my Christian walk, even as a pastor. You see, God delivered me from a heroin addiction, meth addiction. I used to slam meth and heroin, Belushi's. I used to hit that pipe like, man, you would not believe. You know, the first time I shot up, I was a young teenager, 14 years old. I didn't stop shooting up till I was about 21 years of age, till the Lord delivered me from my addiction. And most of you know the story. And I look at passages like this and I say to myself, you know, Lord, I thank you for delivering me. But let me tell you guys something. Have I been tempted since I've been delivered from my addiction? Yes, I have. Because if I were to sit here and tell you that I did not like what I was doing, I'd be lying to you. 
Because the truth was, I enjoyed my addiction. Every time I went to prison, it was behind my addiction. The years that I spent in the system was because of my addiction. But I remember one day somebody telling me, if there was one thing God can do for you, what would that be? And you would just give him your life. And I says, you know, for the first time in my life, I got serious and I said, this drug addiction, if God can take this from me, I will give him the rest of my life. I'll give you the rest of my life. I'll do whatever. And he says, what do you have to lose? And he says, what do you mean? He says, well, it's not like God's asking you for anything. What do you have to lose? I says, nothing. He says, well, then ask him. I remember going back to my cell that evening and just thinking about what this man said. And I remember praying this simple prayer. And I says, you know, God, if you're the God of the Bible, if you're the God that this man says you are, then take this drug addiction from me. And if you do, I will give you the rest of my life. And if you don't, I don't need you in my life and I'll die a dope fiend. And I remember that day, there wasn't no prayer of faith, Jesus come into my heart. It was just, God, if you're, if you're this man that everybody says you are, if you're God, then do this. Next day I woke up, I never touched another needle since. <laughs> Completely delivered. Now, that doesn't mean that everything else changed. You know, as you can see, the Lord works in us, but no longer was I addicted or, or, or bound to that, and I knew that God was real. And then I realized after that, now i got to be a Christian, man. <laughs> Christians weren't cool where I came from, okay? And especially in prison, you know, they're, they're considered the weak of all, you know, and somebody asked me, did you serve God in prison? I says, no. And they said, why? And I says, because I was too much of a coward to do that. I should have did it, but I didn't. Started serving God out here, and the Lord obviously has done a work in my life that I can't explain, and we can only give God the glory for the work that He's done, not only in mine, but in a lot of you here today. And the work that He's started in some of you. Paul here giving these examples, I share that story to say this, because there is a way of escape. And clearly, this is what Paul would imply here. Notice what he says now looking at verse 13. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. In other words, when we feel that we are tempted, listen, you're not the only one that's tempted with those things. I've had so many people come to me, they're like, no, you don't understand, Pastor Dave. What, do I don't, what don't I understand? No, you don't understand what I'm feeling right now. What are you feeling? They begin to, and I'm thinking, I do understand. And I tell them, well, you know, I, I know what you're going through. No, you don't. And then I share this passage with them. There is nothing that you can be tempted with that no one else has not been tempted with. As a matter of fact, can I share something with you that might be even more mind-blowing to you? The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points, but say not. And so here's the example that we're to follow when we struggle with these bouts. Now listen, guys, temptation is not sin. If you're tempted, that doesn't mean you're in sin. James would clearly talk about one falling into sin when he's driven away by the desires of the flesh. But being tempted is not sin itself. And temptation is always going to be there, and you're always going to be tempted. And your issue might not be dope. It might not be drugs. It could be other things that we spoke about. It could be sexual sin. It could be things. Now, listen, I don't know about you guys, but here I am, a man who reads the Word of God like all of you guys. And for some of us, we read it every day. It's our, you know, this is my new, this is my new, this is my new issue right here, you know? It's my new fix, man. And it has been since I became a Christian. But let me explain something to you. Have you ever read the Word? And in reading the Bible, you're getting something out of it. And all of a sudden, this thought just comes in your head. And you're like, whoa. Anybody ever been there? Raise your hand. I'm looking for moral support. God bless you. All righty. <laughs> so check this out. The enemy tempts us. Not only does the enemy tempt us, a lot of people blame the devil. You know, listen, there's really only one person who's ever been tempted by Satan. And that was Jesus himself. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. And we always say, the devil, man, he's on me right now. Well, what are you doing that got him on you? 
You see, there are three things that you battle as a Christian. Jot this down if you're taking notes. Some of you might already know this. This is the basic elementaries of what temptation is. One, obviously, is the devil, Satan. The other, obviously, is the world and the lust of the world and the pride of life. And the other is your flesh. And listen, guys, that's where a lot of this stuff comes from. And the world just feeds that. And so this is what Paul goes on to say. After reminding them in verse 12, as Pastor Tommy shared, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. You see, prior to that verse there in verse 11, this is what I love. Tommy closed it out with this, but we got to park on this for a moment because I think it's imperative for us to understand. And that is in verse 11, he says, listen, all these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The word of God is what's in view here. And this is how one strengthens himself against any temptation that would come his way. Some come to me and they say, I'm being tempted. I tell them, get in the word. Read your word. That's where it's at. You want to be strong in your Christian walk? It's done by spending time getting to know the one who's delivered you from the very mess that you were in. It's Jesus. His word. He sets you free. He delivers you. But not only that, he empowers you with the ability to do the work that God has called you to do. Notice what happens here. He goes on to say here that no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. In other words, you're not the only one. How many of you guys, and clearly by a showing of hands, have been tempted since you've been here these couple of hours? Raise your hand. Look around. You're not alone. And the ones that didn't raise your hands, well, you know, what I always say, God bless you and your little holy life that nothing ever happens. <laughs> But we could be tempted with pride. We could be tempted with arrogance. We can be tempted to be looking at someone or something. Oh, it happens. There's a lot of people here. Temptation is everywhere. So he goes on to say this. No temptation has overtaken you except such is common to man, but God is faithful. In other words, listen, what is he saying in the first part of this passage? You're not alone. Say that. You're not. Pastor David and, and others have shared here clearly giving us, you know, an understanding of how one can withstand. But, but think about this. You just had a senior pastor telling you that he would fall into temptation from time to time. You're not alone. Then he goes on to say here, here's the thing about it. So what do I do? What do I do with this man? But God is faithful. Here's the key to withstanding temptation. Turn very quickly. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4. You guys know the story. Let's read it. The Bible says in verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward, he was hungry. How many of you guys know if you haven't ate for 40 days and 40 nights, you would be hungry too? And then it says, now when the tempter, notice that it says here, the tempter. I think that's important because, listen, there's only one who has that title, and it's not the Lord. And there is one who is a tempter, but notice what it says here, the tempter came to him. He said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. One of the things that I like about this passage here, whenever I find myself struggling or, or, or having a bout with temptation, I always look to the one who gives me the example that I can follow, and that is Jesus. And you know what Jesus did? The first temptation, we already know, we've heard many expository teachings through Matthew chapter 4. What Jesus did here, obviously Jesus gave him the word of God. And notice what he said. The temptation was to his flesh. You ever been tempted in the flesh? I got to have that. I got to watch that. I got to do that. I got to say that. 
Because the flesh wants to be satisfied. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You see, when you look at Israel's history, you see there also that that was a time where the Lord dealt with Israel when they were in the wilderness, and it was the area of trusting God for the provision, and the Lord provided for them. The enemy will want you to think that you can't go to God and trust Him to meet your need. And that's why so many people fall into sin. They say, you want to know what? There was nobody there for me. Nobody understood. Listen, the temptation was only mine. And, you know, I don't know how God can help me in this. Listen, Jesus said it's very clear. The way to get help when you're tempted in the flesh is through the word of God. That's why Bible studies and men's groups and women's groups and one step to freedom groups and lion tamers and all these things are effective Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, church every day of the week. Get in the word because this is what you need. And let me tell you something. If you think you're not being tempted or you won't be tempted, friend of mine, you're, gonna, you're in for a rude awakening. Notice what it goes on else to say here. The devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple. Notice that verse 5 says that the devil took him up. That has always blown me away. That means that to some degree, Satan has power, man. Imagine this temptation you and I wouldn't have been able to do withstand. Jesus did, though. Notice what happens here. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. I love that when he says, for it is written. You know what the devil knows the word too? He knows the word of God. As a matter of fact, he twisted that very thing up all the way in the beginning. Book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 1 through 24. Check it out. He's a master deceiver and he knows the word better than most Christians. And he says it is written. I love that because clearly what he's implying there is it's written concerning you, clearly saying, I understand that Psalm 91 is about you, Jesus. And so what did he do now? He tempted him with all the riches of the world, the kingdoms of the world. He says, here it is, man. Look at, I, I, I can, taking him to the pinnacle of the mountain, and here he is. He's tempting the Lord clearly here. But he goes on to say here, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written. It is written, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. And again the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. You know what I notice in these three temptations, guys? Listen, the enemy is relentless. We need to be relentless also when it comes to God's word. Notice what he goes on to say here. Both times he says here, away, away with you. And we know that in quoting Psalm 91, Satan didn't quote what referred to him there can read in Psalm 91 the demise of Satan. That's the portion of that passage he did not quote. That he would be conquered. He gives you a partial truth, but a partial truth is a whole lie. Notice what he goes on to say here as he tempts him for the third time. So he tempts him with his flesh, and he tempts him with the pride of life, and he tempts him with the lust of the eyes. And notice what he goes on to say here. Jesus responding to all the kingdoms of the world being offered to him. And notice what Jesus said to him. Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Look at verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Notice with me for a moment here, because I think this is important. When you look at what James wrote in the book of James, looking at chapter 4, verse 7. It says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The term here, submit, 
Here's the key. A lot of people say, oh, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But that's not how this passage goes. The only way you can resist the devil is if you first submit to God. Then you can resist. In submitting to God, you are now you are now given the power by way of the Holy Spirit to resist. The word here, submit, in the original language means to line up under. Line up under what? The very will of God and what God has called you to do. Pastor David said it very clearly. The key to victory in my life for these things was obeying. What does that mean? That he was lining up under the will of God then you can resist. The word here, resist, obviously means to stand against. And any time the enemy comes, any time the flesh or the world or anything for that matter, temptation comes, listen, the key to all of this is this. Am I submitted to God? Am I lined up under? Am I where God wants me to be? And the fact of the matter is, you guys have heard testimonies that there are some even within the body of Christ that are not. Because this is a reality that a lot of people don't want to face. Everybody's afraid to go and say that they're being tempted because somewhere down the line, they were told that temptation is sin. And in reality, no, you need to go and you need to make yourself accountable to someone. Somebody asked me one time, why is NAAA so effective? I says, because of the accountability that they have to one another. Something that the church needs to practice. Going to someone and saying, man, I have a problem. And if somebody comes to you with that problem, man, don't be like, you know, like a comadre, you know what I'm saying? And Like you got some juicy business to go and. But the reality is you'd be surprised of how many men and women truly are hurting in the body of Christ. And some people say, well, I don't want to go to a drug and alcohol ministry because, you know, that's really not my thing. You know, I, I struggle with this and this within the last 10 years, I think more has been spoken on about pornography than anything. They used to call it the secret sin. It's not a secret no more. You know, the fact of the matter, like I told my daughter, I says, baby, look, she just turned 15 today. I says, baby, look, first time some knucklehead comes and says, you know, hey, I, you know, can I, you know, I, I like your daughter. I'd be like, cool, let me see your phone. Let me see your computer. Let me check the history. I tell young girls every time I go do purity conferences and speak at conferences to young women, I tell them, you get that sucker's phone, man, and you start looking up the history and see what that dude's been looking at. Because, listen, if he's been watching pornography, he's going to expect you to do the same. And let me tell you something, you will never live up to that wickedness and he'll never be satisfied. And poor guys, anytime we hear pornography, we right away think of the guys, you know, and in here it's like a bunch of cochinos, you know what I mean? But let me tell you, I've known some women who are cochinas too. <laughs> and I've known women that struggle with pornography. And let me tell you something. It'll ruin you. Just like anything that sin is clearly will ruin you. The Bible is very clear. It's Paul writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 6, he says, For the wages of sin is death. I've seen pride and pornography. And anger and drug addiction ruin families and destroy homes. And all the while when an individual thinks, well, you know, it ain't going to happen to me. Tommy gave some really good examples. A man like Samson taking the Nazarite vow. And one of the things that God spoke to his people Israel is he said, you can read it there in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 13 and 14 and on. Read the life of Samson and notice what it goes on to say. First thing he did in chapter 14, it says he went down to the Philistine people, saw a woman down there, and what did he do? He already violated what God said not to do. Don't go outside of our, the children of Israel. We have the word, we have the law, we have the commandments, we have it all. This is, what, this is where it is right here. And he says, hey, Dad, I like her. Go get her for me. What happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. If anything... She got the bad end of the deal. And then what does he do on his way over there? What happens, man? A lion comes out. Well, man, he wipes that thing out. 
comes back walking the way, just killed a lion. I would have been bragging about it. He's not bragging about it. He comes by and he sees this, this thing of honey in the carcass of the lion. And what does he do? He goes and touches this dead carcass, which was a violation of his vow. Takes that honey out and goes and gives it to his family. Then he finds himself walking through the vineyards where the Bible says part of a Nazarite vow, you're going to have, have no dealings with any wine whatsoever. Listen, guys, everything that Samson did was in clear violation of the vow that he had before the Lord. And a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, his strength was in his hair. Don't cut your hair. If that was the case, I was done a long time ago, man. A <laughs> long time ago. Some of you are like, really? You didn't have to turn around for that. The front's already fellowshipping with the back. It's all right. My wife says I still look good, so that's all that matters. As long as she's happy, that's it. But let me tell you something. As he continued to live his life, the power wasn't even in his hair. The hair, was, the hair and his long hair was a part of his vow also. Have you guys not noticed that the whole entire thing about the story of Samson, see, I was taught as a kid the power was in his hair. It was never in his hair. The power was in his identity and who he was. And little by little, he began to lose his identity in what he was. He was set apart for the Lord. And this man lost his identity until the end it led to his demise. That's what sin does. You might be in some type of sin. I don't know, but you might be. Yeah, I haven't gotten caught. Take heed. For some of you, this might just be a reminder. For some of you, it might be a warning. For some of you, it might be the very thing today where the Lord is saying, stop. I love you too much. Numbers 32, verse 23 says, be sure your sin will find you out. And I'll tell you something. I've done this to men. I've gotten their phones like, hey, let me see your pictures, man. What's going on here? Going to, you know, you know, the system and popping that and start looking. And the next thing you know, I start looking down and yeah, and they're looking at me and it's like, yeah, these are nice pictures, man. All of a sudden I'm reading their history. They don't even know it. I'm like, oh, that's a good picture, man. That's that's cute. Who's that? He's like, which one is it? Hold on, I'll tell you, show you right now. <laughs> and I've done this. And I've turned their phone to them and I says, you're a fake, man. And the look on their face, I says, you, you, you watch pornography. You watch pornography. The reality is, listen, God could never do the work that he desires to do in you until you say, Lord, I don't want nothing to do with this. All I want is you. And the enemy will make you think that God can't satisfy you. Yes, he can. What I always say is this, guys. Listen, I didn't ask for anything that I do now as a pastor. I didn't ask for any of this. If Jesus Christ had only come just to forgive me of my sin, he's done enough. Because I know the sins that he's forgiven me of. And Pastor David Rosales this morning, great reminder when he says there are sins that you won't even mention. Oh, yeah, there are sins that only me and God know about. And I know I'm forgiven. Let me tell you something. When I'm tempted, I dive in this word. I dive in it. Have we fallen? Yes. Have we dropped the ball? Yes. But here's the thing. God is greater. God wants to meet you where you're at today. You might say, well, I got a position in the church. Pride is hindering you from God doing the work that he desires to do in you. Oh, you don't understand. I brought somebody. This is more for them. It's not for me. You get the thing, Pastor Dave? We need to work together, bro. <laughs> no, it's for all of us. Who can stand here today and say with all sincerity of heart, oh, I know that my heart is right before the one true God. I know that a lot of us will say, well, then if anything, we should all be standing up. But I want to do this today before I close. I want real men and real women to say, Lord, forgive me. 
from this day forward, right here. I don't want this to be the burden in my life that weighs me down from knowing you more. Church, we are close. You know what I'm talking about. We've been looking up because our redemption draweth nigh. And the fruit that you should be bearing is fruit that remains. And the Lord should be getting the glory in your life. So without asking you to bow your head and close your eyes, as we say, you know, when I got into the neighborhood and they said, hey, homie, you want to be from the Vardu? I'm like, yeah. They didn't go, okay, bow your head and close your eyes, homie. <laughs> you want in? Yes. If we're not ashamed, and for us it's about him and not about us because the cry of your heart should be more of you and less of me. Listen, you mothers that you've been praying for your sons, man, do you see miracles up here. Don't stop praying. I am the result of a praying mom. I'm going to ask you guys to do something. I want to pray with you. There might be some here today that you could say, I was invited here. Man, I'm challenged. I'm encouraged. I'm reminded that there is hope. I'm reminded that I don't have to live this way. I'm reminded that I don't have to go through this alone. There are many like me, even some that were tempted today and this morning and so on and so forth. But you can be sincere and honest in your heart. Lord, I want to experience that. And let me tell you something. Not only can you experience prior to coming to Christ, but you just heard the testimony of Pastor David through you. You can experience it even as a pastor. God loves you so much. He's not ashamed of you. So let's not be ashamed of him.